Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop on Firewise and Sustainable Landscaping. We are, uh, uh, this is a joint presentation between the Grove Street Fire Safe Council, the Sonoma Ecology Center, and the Habitat Corridor Project, and i um, happy to welcome you to it. We have uh, a panel of experts in the area of Firewise and Sustainable Landscaping. So, uh, Without too much more ado, I'm going to turn it over. I just do want to mention that uh, the workshop is being recorded. So that said, I'm going to turn it over to Ellie Inslee, and I'd like to. Uh, she is with uh, Sonoma Ecology Center, and uh, they'll be running the program. So, Ellie, over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, David, and, and everyone out there, thank you very, very much for joining us. I'm Ellie Inslee, um, a landscape architect with a specialty in natural habitat restoration, and I'm also a board member of the Sonoma Ecology Center. And I want to add to David's remarks earlier that this Resilient Landscapes Coalition is a team that also includes the UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County, along with the Habitat Corridor Project and the Sonoma Ecology Center. So I'm really happy to be the first of the three panelists on this subject of Firewise and Sustainable Landscaping, with the subtitle Garden as if Life Depends on It. And that refers to the importance of protecting human life by maintaining the 100 foot defensible space area around the home but also taking care of wildlife and the habitat that we share with them. After the fires in 2017, the Sonoma Ecology Center began leading fire recovery walks into the burned landscapes in the eastern part of Sonoma Valley once it was safe. And we met many people who were understandably traumatized. And we also met some of them who had overzealously cleared most of the vegetation within 100 feet of their homes, unintentionally causing problems of erosion growth of weeds that are highly ignitable, and obviously for us, loss of wildlife habitat. And we knew others who hesitated to do anything because they'd nurtured their gardens for decades until the fire inspector came along and ordered them to do extensive vegetation removal. So we realized that there were gaps in knowledge and an ability to take action, and we decided to do something about it. So, before I go any further, I want to thank the folks at the Grove Street Fire Safe Council, particularly Nancy Kerwin and David Duncan, who encouraged us to do this presentation. They've been very supportive. And Roberta McIntyre of the Fire Safe Sonoma nonprofit, who is our producer or, or something. She's extremely talented in, in the technological aspects of this, besides the, the fire safety aspect. So we couldn't have done this without you. Thanks, Roberta. And I, I wanted to mention that um, I've visited both the Diamond A and George Ranch websites. And those are the two communities that created this Fire Safe Council. And they're very coordinated and well organized. And I was extremely impressed, but not surprised that they had created this Fire Safe Council, which is a, a really huge undertaking and, and extremely important to keep to keep us safe from the devastations of fire. So there are many of you who are joining us from other locations. I wanna ask you to please put your name and where you're from in the chat box, if you don't mind, or at least uh, just put down what town or what part of Sonoma County or what other county or even state that you might be from. That would be very helpful so that some of us can, um, so that we can tailor our remarks accordingly. So the idea here is for defensible space to be beautiful, sustainable, and biodiverse. So I have in this picture here a beautiful plant called heuchera or coral bells in the understory of an oak tree. And the, the, this is a, a native perennial that can be very fire wise. And, and so it illustrates what we're trying to accomplish here, creating habitat and biodiversity while also being fire safe. So our team, I'm going to describe them. And, and in this <clears throat> image, it shows the website for our group, the Resilient Landscapes Coalition, sonomaresilientlandscapes.com. And it's a, it's a young website, but it's got a lot of information on it. I think you'll find it useful. 
So the folks from the Sonoma Ecology Center include uh, Caitlin Cornwall, myself, and Jason Mills. UC Cooperative Extension Program, or UC Master Gardener Program of Sonoma County is led by Mimi Enright and also Cleo Tarazi, who is the president of the board. And then April Owens from the Habitat Corridor Project. She's the executive director of the nonprofit and she's also the chair of the horticulture program of the local uh, California Native Plant Society. So we also are working in partnership with Fire Safe Sonoma, in particular, Roberta McIntyre, and the County of Sonoma Fire Prevention Division, and that's Carolyn Safford and Chief Williams, Chief James Williams. And this team has spent countless hours preparing this, this information over the last year. We've actually given a couple of other workshops. One to the people, there's a fire wise community on Bennett Ridge. We gave a presentation in December and we did another one for the community in Glen Ellen, all of whom had been devastated by the fire. So we were actually, the, the way this started was the people at Bennett Ridge asked me if the Ecology Center could do a presentation. And uh, I, I met April and she brought in Mimi. So that's how our team got started. But the other, the fire agency people have added a really important perspective. Whereas ecologists, we might see a group of bushes with a tree nearby as providing food and shelter for wildlife, a firefighter might look at that same bush and see it as a potential burning bush and a possible ladder fuels leading to crown fire. So it's really important to see both perspectives as we move ahead. So our agenda today, I'll be talking for 20 minutes providing um, the regulations and information on ecology and sustainability. Mimi Enright will be talking for about 45 minutes on the subject of basic design principles, right plant, right place, maintenance and neighborhood considerations. And April will be talking for another 40 minutes at the end about examples of landscape design with beautiful plants to inspire you. So a few words about regulation. It's the landowner's responsibility to be familiar with regulations. So there's state and county regulations for the defensible space. There's the State Public Resources Code 4291. And I'll um, be talking in more detail though about the Sonoma County Ordinance Chapter 13A. Both, both of these codes actually it's in a patchwork around the county. So you might be subject to one code, whereas your neighbor might be subject to another. And it can be confusing, but it's important to be, to be familiar with them. And Cleo, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat box the URLs for those two codes, that would be really helpful. And if you live along a stream or creek, it's important to know the regulations that might, you might be subject to before doing any vegetation modification. So the county has something called a riparian corridor combining zone. And that usually occurs along the, the main channels of streams, but it's a good idea to check the, the county and find out if you're in the RC combining zone. The state fish and wildlife and regional water quality control board are very interested in keeping vegetation on the land for wildlife and also water quality. And there's the Army Corps of Engineers and, and Federal Fish and Wildlife to be aware of, although that would be less likely to, to come across when you're dealing with firewise landscaping. So I'm going to just really quickly run through Ordinance 13A, the Sonoma County one, because the, the state, it mirrors the state ordinance. And so as written now, and it, and it is in the process of changing, it's important to maintain a 30-foot dispensable space around all structures cutting the grass to six inches or less, but not to bare soil. Tree branches need to be limbed up six feet from the ground. Shrubs need to be maintained, and there's a lot of detail that we'll be providing about how to do that, including horizontal and vertical spacing. Climbing vines must be maintained to be clear of dead and dying materials and or removed from trees and structures. It's also important to remove dead and dying vegetation from the property at all times. 
And then additional defensible space to 100 feet from all buildings may be required depending on slope and fuel type. And by the way, this, um, our, our presentation decks will be on the Grove Street Fire Safe Council website, and we will also have it on our Sonoma Resilient Landscape website. And as far as trees and roofs, remove all portions of trees within 10 feet of the chimney and or stovepipe outlets. Maintain trees adjacent to or overhanging a structure free of dead or dying wood. Maintain the roof free of leaves, needles, and other dead or dying wood. And maintain a 10-foot clearance adjacent to the roadside. And Mimi will be going into more detail about that, but I just wanted to highlight some frequently asked questions. Should I cut down or cut back the tree overhanging my house? There is no requirement to remove trees um, or even overhanging branches except within 10 feet of chimneys and the dead or dying branches. And it's super important to clean the leaves and debris on the roof. Should I cut down trees around my house? Again, there are no requ requirements to cut down trees. Um, it is important to eliminate ladder fuels so a fire on the ground won't reach up into the trees and then to your house. And it's also important to keep some spacing among groups of trees for, for the same reason. And then what about fire safe plant lists? We have found that many plant lists using those plants that are supposedly fire safe can create a false sense of security. They can be confusing because one list in one county might include certain plants that are considered fire hazards that other plant lists will show as fire safe. And there can be problematic species. So our team definitely does not encourage plant lists. So on the question of wildland urban interface, climate change and homes in the fire prone zone have caused increasing occurrence of loss of property and life. In this, this issue of climate change, we have increasingly dry summers and severe wind events. So we are having more fires also because there are more people in the fire prone zone and the more people you have, the more chances of ignition. And not to mention PG&E wires igniting right, left and center. But to tell you, to show a little bit about this wildland urban interface, the map on the left, 1964 Hanley fire shows the pink outline where the fire occurred and the, the light tan is the low density housing. And this is just northeast of Santa Rosa. In the 2017 Tubbs fire, you can see is a very similar location, but the, the, the tan low density housing has moved into the fire prone zone. So this is the wildland urban interface in, engaged with an area that's very fire prone. And the, the Grove Street community is a, an example of this exact same thing between 1964 and today, uh, over 300 properties have been developed. It's that area is not as fire prone. However, it's obvious that with climate change, there's a chance that, that a severe fire can occur. And so now that we've moved into these zones that are prone to fire, it's our responsibility to take care of the land and to take care of our neighbors and working in community is a good way to do that. So the rest of my talk will be talking, will be the ecology side, taking care of our non-human neighbors. And um, this is my favorite subject, of course. So in, this, in these pictures, we have a painted lady, which is a beautiful butterfly on coyote mint, a native plant that grows locally. And it's a, it's a low growing perennial, so it's great for firescaping. And then there's a Buick's wren on a red bud. We love native plants in our group. And um, I imagine the beauty of the landscape and the wildlife are some of the reasons why you've moved here and continue to stay in this area. Um, it's certainly true for me. We have an important role in taking care of it all, since in a very real sense, we've displaced species by moving in. So Doug Tallamy, who wrote the book, Bringing Nature Home, he's an entomologist and uh, he promotes the idea of making our gardens into habitat islands. He opens the book with the statement, for the, for the first time in history, 
gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. So our gardens can make a difference if we support ecosystem services. And those services that we can help provide in our garden include pollination, sequestering carbon, cleaning and managing the water, slowing it, sinking it, spreading it, and storing it, enriching soil and holding it in place. So I'll say a few words about biodiversity, which is the web of life above and below ground, including plants, animals, fungi, and microorganisms. And it has been declining alarmingly. In uh, 2017, a German study reported a decline of more than 75% of insect biomass. That's 75% decline across 63 nature areas in Germany between 89 and 2016. And many of us are familiar with the continuing drop in monarch butterflies. Currently, there's less than 3% of the 1980 numbers. So, and insects are the foundation of many of our life systems. They pollinate a spectrum of plants, including many of those that humans rely on for food. And they're key players in other important jobs, including breaking down dead things and, and turning them into building blocks for new life. So the declines are due to habitat loss and degradation from development, climate change, moving too fast for adaptation or relocation, widespread use of pesticides in agriculture, but also in our residential and commercial landscapes, and invasive plant and animal species, and also light pollution. But as Doug Tallamy said, our gardens can make a difference. So we like to encourage people to choose native plants to in 70 to 80% of their landscaping. And it's of course okay to keep 20 to 30% of your favorite non-natives like your roses or lemons or camellia. But native plants improve biodiversity by providing food to wildlife that have evolved with those plants over millennia. And it's surprising but true that insects, which feed birds and, and other wildlife, do specialize on specific plants. And these plants can't, or the wildlife can't survive or reproduce without them. And the picture here shows a pipe vine swallowtail which lays its eggs and then the caterpillars emerge and grow only on the pipe vine plant. So if there's no pipe vine, there's no pipe vine swallowtail. So April, we'll be talking more about massing plants for wildlife food and shelter and use integrative pest management. If at all possible, don't use insecticides or herbicides and provide a water source. And here's a picture of our charismatic megafauna state bird, it nests on the ground. So having habitat on the ground where the quail can safely nest is important. I actually had a clutch of 17 quail in my backyard this spring, and uh, it was really fascinating to watch the, the nesting happen and, and, just, and then see the eggs hatch. It was really incredible. So a few words about plant communities. Plant communities are unique associations of plants that share the same habitat needs. They're dominant species like oaks in oak woodlands, and they have associated understory plants that do well together. So it helps to be aware of which plant community you're in and so that you can make appropriate plant selections for your garden. So the oak woodland includes different species in different locations like the valley oak grows in the valley bottoms and the deep alluvial soils. The blue oak and the coast live oak grow on the slopes and hilltops. And the oak woodland is also associated with the grassland plant community. And there's the redwood forest, which grows in east facing slopes and canyons. Jack London State Park in Sonoma Valley is an example. The riparian forest grows along streams from 50 feet to 300 feet within the 50 to 300 foot zone, or even more from stream banks. And these plant species have higher water needs. And then chaparral, which is a shrub dominated community that grows on west facing slopes where it's much hotter and drier with the afternoon sun. So Sonoma Valley and Sonoma County has all of these 
communities and there are many more but we focus mostly on these and most of them except for the riparian plant community are adapted to fire and even need fire so oak woodlands this is a, a photograph of an oak woodland with an understory of coral bells which is a drought tolerant plant and won't damage the root systems so oak trees are incredibly productive food factories for wildlife they have the highest food productivity productivity of any tree species with their acorns and abundance of caterpillars. They host a variety of insects that support many of our favorite garden birds, such as quail, bluebirds, robins, orioles, and acorn woodpeckers. And I recently learned that wood ducks eat acorns, at least the ones in Texas. I'm not sure about California wood ducks. But in Texas, the wood ducks actually something like 89% of their diet is, is in acorns, which just amazed me. Uh, acorn, or the acorns of oaks feed over 100 vertebrate species, including squirrels and deer. And because many insects feed on the leaves, twigs, and bark of the oak, it's important to protect the root system so that it's, it becomes a healthy tree or remains a healthy tree. And doing that means avoiding compaction, avoiding digging around the root system as much as possible, of course, and uh, not and only planting drought tolerant species. And then also keeping oak leaf litter, which supports microorganisms. And in the defensible space zone, it's not recommended to have leaf litter of any depth. A couple of inches is okay within in the in the 30 foot zone. And when you get from 30 to 100 feet, any amount of leaf litter is fine. So this uh, sequestering carbon, which our gardens can do, plants photosynthesize by drawing CO2 from the air and drawing water and nutrients from the soil to produce plant materials both above and below ground. And the carbon is sequestered both in the plants and the soil. And interesting, statistically, soils are capable of holding more carbon dioxide than the atmosphere or plant and, and animal life combined. So it's a, soils are a huge carbon sink. To sequester it efficiently, the plant, either tree, shrub, or grass, must have a robust set of microorganisms underground. So an underground, healthy underground biodiversity. And just by taking care of our gardens, we can do that. And Mimi will be talking in more detail about that. So keeping the soil in place is important by keeping vegetation cover and mulch. It's important for the, the soil itself, but it's also important for stream water quality. And the fish in the, in the streams, excuse me, rely on clean water so that they can find the benthic macroinvertebrates or the aquatic bugs that they feed on and um, also so that they can they can actually easily move the set move the the gravels to lay their eggs so just a couple of words on maintenance for habitat values the best time to maintain your property is in late summer and winter when wildlife have fin well when birds have finished nesting. So September to February is the best time for substantial maintenance. If you're doing any clearing of any degree, you don't want to be disturbing birds while they're nesting. Although it's important to prune dead and dying plant material all year long, especially now during fire season, and keep the soil covered, avoiding overclearing. And and this is. This is an example of birds that nest on the ground, the Oregon junco. They actually do nest right there on the ground. So keep an eye out when you're doing your, your vegetation management. And then it's important to avoid overclearing. This landscape here is devoid of vegetation. So erosion will be a big issue. It provides no wildlife habitat and it's asking for invasive fire prone plant species to invade, such as this broom plant, which is, uh, it's very fire prone and takes a lot of work to maintain or to remove. Each plant can produce over a thousand seeds and it likes to project them so it spreads very quickly. 
And then just circling back to this biodiversity question, light pollution, this, this oak tree is so lovely and some might be inclined to really highlight it like this, but it's really hard for an insect, a caterpillar or a bird to use this tree. And it is probably even hard for this tree to grow properly. While insects aren't adequately studied, it's thought that half of the millions of insect species are nocturnal and they're unable to locate food or mates when there's artificial lighting like this. And those active in the day may also be disturbed by light at night when they're trying to rest. So it's best to turn off lights when you're not using them or use motion activated lighting. And the, the insect in the lower left corner is our native firefly. While the female who has the light doesn't fly, the male does, and he finds her by the light she emits. So this is my last slide. We encourage you to become more intimate with your garden and your wildlife neighbors while reducing fire risk and enhancing biodiversity. It's definitely worth the time and effort. And I'd like to turn this over to Mimi Enright, who's the program manager of the UC Master Gardener program. Great. Thanks so much, Ellie. As Ellie mentioned, my name is Mimi Enright and I'm the program manager for the UC Master Gardener program of Sonoma County. And hopefully many of you are familiar with who we are and what we do. We are trained agents of the University of California. And our mission is to extend the educational outreach of the university uh, in our communities. Um, and we do that with a focus on uh, sustainable landscape principles as our core message. So after the 2017 wildfires, um, our Master Gardener program spent a year doing a deep dive into all the content that is out there on defensible space. And our goal was really to synthesize and simplify the content for our community. Um, and we really consider um, this uh, presentation that we developed in partnership with all the partners that, uh, that Ellie introduced um, as version 2.0 of our FireWise educational um, outreach, because it really has much more specific recommendations for the different zones of defensible space around your home. Um, and uh, as Ellie also mentioned, we really are proud of this partnership that we've developed with Sonoma Ecology Center and Habitat Quarter Project. Um, and also want to extend a, a huge thank you to our partners, uh, Carol Leon Safford and Chief Williams from the County of Sonoma Office of Fire and Emergency Services for their um, uh, patience and work with us over the last year as we um, made sure we were all on the same page with the message that we were communicating to our community, um, as well as uh, Roberta McIntyre with FireSafe Sonoma. So our goal um, uh, with this workshop and presentation is really to marry sustainable landscape principles uh, with FireWise landscaping recommendations. Um, and as Ellie so eloquently shared, uh, this is critically important as our climate is changing and so are our landscapes. And um, we all firmly believe that each property can and should make a difference in supporting biodiversity and in being prepared for future fires. So uh, we're hoping to help provide some clarity and simplicity to the, the volume, extensive volume of information on this topic. And I wanted to make sure to point out that this is not meant um, as prescriptive mandates, but as guidelines for each individual homemaker for de decision making on your own um, properties. Um, and each of us, of course, needs to be making appropriate decisions to be better prepared as we move ahead. Okay, so I've got a lot of slides and a lot of territory to cover in a very short amount of time. So uh, I'm gonna do just a really quick touch on um, some fire basics uh, as it informs the conversation that we're having today. Um, then move into uh, designing for fire and plant selection considerations. Then um, some more detailed discussion on how to design your home landscape with fire in mind based on the different zones in the zero to 100 feet defensible space zone uh, around your home. And then a quick review of mulch and then ongoing maintenance, which is one of the most important aspects of continuing to keep our properties as ready as we can before the next fire. So let's go ahead and, and dive on in. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on how fire operates, um, but uh, it's, uh, it's important to understand that there are three elements uh, that are required uh, in order uh, to have a fire. And those are fuel, oxygen, and heat. 
And which of those can we control in our environment? <clears throat> That's fuel. And fuel is basically, at its very simplest level, uh, anything that will burn. Uh, and that includes uh, not only vegetation in our landscapes um, or landscape mulch, but fencing, roofing, decks, lawn furniture, arbors, trellises, and planter boxes. Um, so uh, it's, it's not only about our, uh, our vegetation selections, but it's also about um, these other elements which we need to take into consideration can provide fuel in a fire uh, situation. So there are three threats or exposures that a building can experience during a wildfire. Those include uh, direct flame uh, or radiant heat from uh, an adjacent fire or embers. And as we are all unfortunately so familiar with now, uh, embers under wildfire conditions uh, are persistent and unpredictable. Um, and they have a way of finding a weakness in a home. Uh, in fact, most building ignitions have been attributed to embers. Uh, they can ignite building components or contents directly or ignite vegetation and other combustible items, items adjacent to or near a building. And this can then result in a radiant heat and or direct flame contact exposure. For example, uh, ember, embers may land on and ignite debris that has accumulated in your gutter. And the burning debris then causes direct flame contact on the edge of the roof. Or embers can ignite nearby vegetation, which could result in radiant heat exposure to the side of a building, potentially igniting combustible siding or breaking the glass in a window. The opening from broken glass would then allow embers to enter the building and ignite combustible materials such as carpeting or furniture. So today we're focusing on the fuels in the 100 feet surrounding your home. And the concept of the home ignition zone was developed by USDA Forest Service fire scientist Jack Cohan in the late 1990s, following some breakthrough experimental research into how homes ignite due to the effects of radiant heat. And since then, wildfire safety recommendations have been shaped by this fire science. And because of it, we are able to provide actionable guidance for homeowners to help them prepare homes and home landscapes to resist wildfire. So it's important to consider what your goals are in preparing for the next fire. Certainly want, we want to slow the fire and reduce the possibility of it catching your house on fire. But it's also important to ensure that there is an exit plan for you and your family. It's just as important to ensure there is appropriate access for firefighters coming in to defend your home for their safety. So um, since uh, most of our, oops, sorry, did I just go out of presentation mode? Huh. I'm sorry. Yeah, it looks like you're okay on our end. Oh, huh. You're okay. Right. You're okay. okay. Let me, uh, sorry, you guys. I'm, there we go. Sorry. A little screen management issues. Um, so since the bulk of our audience are Sonoma County residents, I assume most of you have been through at least the Kincaid fire, if not the Kincaid and the 2017 fires complex. And here's the bottom line, what you do to prepare your home and landscape for the next fire matters. And we know what the truths are in this slide and in this presentation. And your actions to prepare for the next wildfire are really key. We all know how hard our firefighters have worked to protect our homes and communities. And given the scope of the wildfires we have seen, we know that we can assume that there will be a shiny red truck parked outside of our home when the fire comes. So while attending this workshop is a great first step, uh, it's really important to, um, to take action. And it can even be small actions that you can take. And we're hoping today's presentation will, um, will start help you, uh, helping you with some first steps on the path to making your house more uh, prepared for the next wildfire. Okay, so uh, it's important to start at the house uh, and work out. So your, this is your starting point. And we're not going into the topic of home hardening today, as our focus is on the landscape. But there are many wonderful resources to help guide you through the home hardening process. Um, but here are the different defensible space zones in your home landscape that we will be discussing today. So the first is the immediate zone surrounding your house, and that's the zero to five foot zone. Then we move out to the five to 30 foot zone. 
And finally, we have considerations for the 30 to 100 foot zone. So here are our basic principles um, for firewise landscaping. So resilient garden design is about plant selection and placement, overall garden design with hardscape elements, and maintenance. And we hope that all this is done as Ellie so um, uh, beautifully articulated with a lens of sustainability about retaining water on your property, conserving water and energy, supporting wildlife, and sequestering carbon. So there is not scientific research to support all of our recommendations. I will point out through the presentation where recommendations are supported by scientific research. And as we go through today's presentation, any items you see highlighted in red represent county code requirements. Okay, so let's start with some basic concepts for creating a firewise landscape. We recommend choosing firewise, fire resistant landscape features such as inorganic mulch, gravel or decomposed granite, permeable pavement, stone walls, ponds, dry creek beds, or boulders. You wanna carefully select and place plants with spacing to disrupt fire. And you want to, of course, uh, continue to maintain those. It's ongoing maintenance is critical to keep your landscape healthy uh, and prepared for the next fire. Throughout the year, you need to remove any dead or dying shrubs, trees, or branches. So here we have an, an, um, an indicator, since this is highlighted in red, that this is a county code requirement. We want to avoid planting close to structures as embers landing in those plants can transmit fire to your home. And you wanna prune all tree limbs six feet up from the ground or one third the height of a smaller tree. For example, if a tree is 12 feet high, you wanna limit up to four feet from the ground, and then of course continue to maintain it as it grows. Uh, and again, we've got uh, another highlighted red item uh, in the pruning the tree limbs at least six feet up from the ground to indicate that that's a county code requirement. Okay, we wanna of course make it easy for firefighters to find you. If you have multiple driveways off one access road, you wanna place a sign at the beginning of the road with all the numbers and then place a sign at each driveway and on the house. And reflective street and address signs are a county code requirement. So there's a really compelling video from the Kincaid fire where firefighters are um, trying to hold off the fire from moving into the town of Windsor. And the video clip shows wood fences burning and moving the fire to the house. So it's, uh, it's very important to replace any wood fence or gate that attaches to your home. And there's lots of really great alternatives in uh, non-organic materials that can provide you screening or protection while uh, helping to preserve your views. Okay, so let's dive into plant selection considerations. So um, plant selection should no longer be about, oh, this flower is pretty, though um, um, I'm just as tempted as everyone else when I go into the nursery with, um, with pretty flowers and wanting them uh, to put them into my, uh, my home landscape. But there are much broader considerations from a fire and ecology perspective that we should be taking into account. A poorly planted plant is stressed and requires more water, more nutrients, and is more susceptible to predation, drought, and fire. So the right plant in the right place is very important consideration in firewise landscaping. So it's important to choose plants that will grow to a size that's appropriate for their location. So when you pick up that four inch pot with a plant at the nursery, you need to pay attention to what its mature size will be and where you are planning to put it in your landscape. And of course you wanna locate plants where excess uh, pruning is not required to maintain desired spacing. You also need to consider uh, whether you're putting a plant um, where it will thrive. Uh, if it's a plant that prefers shade, are you putting it in full sun? And are you up for the maintenance uh, that that plant is going to require? Uh, will it spread to a neighbor's property uh, and be invasive? And you also want to consider how that plant might change over its lifespan. So uh, lavender is a great example here. Uh, it's a very popular uh, landscape plant. 
it starts out as herbaceous, non-woody, but it becomes much more woody over time. Um, so after being deeply enmeshed in this topic, I've really started to see my landscape through a different lens. I think about how fire will move through that landscape around my home and how much fuel that would add to a fire. How much woody mass is there? With this lens last winter, I cut back some larger salvias that had become very woody and they've grown back beautifully this last spring with much more herbaceous stems and much less woody mass. They'll become woody again in a year or two and I'll have to cut them back again. Um, but if you don't want this type to do this type of regular maintenance, then plant selection for how a plant may change over time is an important consideration as well. So um, as Ellie shared um, at the front of this, um, all plants uh, will burn. And some of you may have come to today's session hoping for a list of fire resistant plants for your garden. In the scientific community, there is a lack of consensus on the elements to test to confirm plant flammability. So given this, the University of California does not advocate the use of fire resistant plant lists. And applied to plants, the term fire resistant can be misleading since all plants will burn under the right conditions. And this picture shows some succulents that burned uh, during the Tubbs fire in the front, Fountain Grove area. On hot, windy days when the ground is dry and plants have little moisture in the stems or leaves, fire can race through almost any landscape, threatening homes and lives. If there's any defense against fire in landscaping, it is more likely through Firewise landscape design and maintenance rather than plant selection. Okay, where shouldn't you plant? Um, we will spend more time shortly on the zero to five foot zone around your home. Scientific research supports making this an ember-free zone to prevent embers from igniting your home when they land in organic matter. Other places that are especially vulnerable to fire include under vents and eaves, in front of windows or combustible siding, under or near decks, <clears throat> and inside corners. These are all places where embers can introduce fire directly into your home. Okay, hopefully you're all familiar with the concept of ladder fuels. So the goal is to reduce the possibility of having the fire move from the ground plane. So you want to avoid planting shrubs under trees, <clears throat> but if you do, allow at least three times the height of a shrub between uh, it and the lowest tree limb. Uh, and as we stressed before, of course, you need to, and it's a county code requirement, to limb all trees at least six feet up from the ground or one third of the height of the tree. Uh, and then again, it's critical to maintain it as it grows. Okay, so uh, let's talk about spacing guidelines, plant spacing guidelines. Um, these are CAL FIRE recommendations, and I wanna stress that these are recommendations for plant spacing guidelines within 100 feet of your home. So these are not mandated requirements, these are recommendations. And these guidelines are um, for both horizontal and vertical spacing, and they're due to the possibility of flame contributing to flame height. And the slope of the land around the home is a major consideration in assessing wildfire risk, as a fire will burn faster and more intensely uphill than along flat ground. And a steeper slope will result in faster moving fire with longer flame lengths. So spacing between grass, shrubs, and trees is crucial to help reduce the spread of wildfires. Uh, and this, of course, the spacing needed is greater based on the slope of the land. So on flat or gently sloping terrain, individual shrubs or small clumps, clumps of shrubs should be separated from one another by at least twice the height of the average shrub. And for homes located on steeper slopes, the separation distance, of course, should be greater. For example, the typical, if the typical shrub height in a plant grouping is two feet, you would wanna create a separation of at least four feet by removing shrubs or pruning to reduce the height and or diameter. So this graphic depicts shrub spacing and low growing, well irrigated grasses, ground covers or perennials are considered to be acceptable between these plant groupings. 
But of course, each of us needs to assess the overall risk with the degree of slope <clears throat> and the fire risk to make appropriate decisions in our own home landscape. This graphic depicts suggested horizontal tree spacing as well as vertical separation. <clears throat> and those are those ladder fuels that we discussed earlier. Note again, the three times the height of the shrub from the top of the shrub to the lowest branches. So spacing on less than a 20% slope of 10 feet is recommended. And on steeper slopes, that recommended distance, of course, is increased. So as Ellie referred to, we don't have to denude our landscapes in the 100 foot perimeter around our home. But we do want to ensure that we have spacing to reduce the fuel volume and help break up the flow of the fire to the house. So the previous slide showed CAL FIRE recommendations on tree and shrub spacing. This is a recommendation from the National Fire Protection Association, or the NFPA. And there are good arguments to justify both perspectives. But this just gives you another perspective on tree spacing based on the distance from your home. Uh, and these are all just best recommendations to support improving your home's fire safety. And again, you want to consider your own property specific aspects to make appropriate decisions to increase your safety. Okay. So let's start moving into the, the three different defensible space zones in the 100 foot defensible space around your home. So the first zone we're gonna discuss is the zero to five foot zone. So this is uh, zone zero, the zero to five foot zone, which we call the ember defense zone. So the objective of this zone is to reduce the chance of windblown embers from a fire landing near the home and igniting combustible debris or materials, thus exposing the home to flames. This zone is closest to the house, so it requires the most careful selection and management of vegetation and other possible fuels. So classically, we've massed shrubs against the house called foundation shrubs. So this is a big shift away from how we have designed our landscapes. Um, but we really need to think about um, the fuel in this direct proximity to our home and, and how that can um, contribute to bringing fire in immediate proximity to our home. So this is actually a relatively newer uh, zone introduced into the defensible space recommendations. In fact, um, a year ago when Ellie and April and I sat down to start developing this content, uh, you couldn't find any graphics that supported the zero to five foot uh, defensible space zone, but it's, it's uh, being much more broadly uh, accepted and adopted. Uh, and this is um, supported, this zone, this ember defense zone, is supported by scientific research that was conducted by Dr. Stephen Quarles after he left the University of California and moved to doing research with the Insurance Institute of Business, Home, and Safety. And they have some really, the Insurance Institute has some really great videos online showing them doing testing in the lab to show the risk to the home resulting from embers. Uh, so I really want to stress that this is a scientifically supported recommendation, but it perhaps is the one that most people will struggle with um, because it really is counter to what we have traditionally uh, done in our landscapes. So we want to, the recommendations for the zero to five foot ember defense zone are no combustible materials in this zone, uh, that you consider use of non-flammable mulch such as gravel or stone. Uh, especially during fire season, you should remove natural fiber doormats. Uh, and as discussed earlier, you want to remove or replace any flammable fencing material that may be attached to your home. So um, we talked about uh, earlier, during a wildfire, thousands of embers can rain down on roofs and pelt the sides of the homes like hail during a storm. Uh, and if these embers become lodged in something easily, uh, they can easily ignite on or near a house. The home is then, of course, in jeopardy of burning. So as Ellie uh, referred to in her presentation, we're not saying, and it is not county uh, code requirements, that all existing trees must be removed. But you really should consider placement and especially regular maintenance of your trees. And if a tree is close to the house, uh, ensure that you are regularly cleaning the roof of debris during the fire season. So those leaves pile up in the same places every year. Uh, and the biggest problem here in this picture, of course, would be exposure to the vulnerable walls, um, not uh, the possibly class A roofing material. 
So embers coming into contact with flammable material is, um, is cited as the major reason why homes are um, destroyed during wildfire. So in, um, of course, as we mentioned earlier, in the zero to five foot ember defense zone, it is a county record requirement to remove any dead branches and to limb up existing tree limbs. Um, there is a risk associated with having branches over the roof. Um, some recommendations are to keep limbs six, above, six feet above the roof. Uh, it is not a county code requirement, um, but again, really stressing that roof litter maintenance is key. Um, but county code does mandate cutting tree limbs 10 feet from stovepipe or chimney outlets, and that is a year-round requirement, not just in, um, in fire season. Okay, so we've talked about how important maintenance, maintenance is on a regular basis. So we wanted to highlight some of the maintenance considerations you wanna keep in mind in your zero to five foot ember defense zone. And this should be done on a regular basis during fire season. So of course, clean up and dispose of leaves, pine needles, or other plant litter. Remove debris from uh, roofs and gutters. And climbing vines must be free of dead or dying material. And this is in fact a county record code requirement in the zero to 30 foot zone. So of course it applies to zero to five um, or to remove them from any uh, trees or structures. Okay, let's move into our next zone, which is zone one, <clears throat> uh, five to 30 foot zone, uh, the home defense zone. And this is often referred to as the lean, clean and green zone. So in this zone, uh, the recommendation is to plant in islands separated by hardscape. Uh, optimally, you want to select low ground covers such as mown native grass, herbaceous perennials, and succulents. Um, but this is also a really great zone for hardscape elements such as a pool, brick patio, paving stones, dry creek bed, boulders, etc. And uh, the goal, of course, is to reduce the connectivity between your garden beds, shrubs, and trees. So if wildfire does come into this zone, the wildfire will not be able to burn to the house or into the crowns of trees. Um, you also wanna keep in mind that this zone creates a place for fire per personnel to be located to defend your home or property in a wildfire situation. So you wanna maintain trees and shrubs in well-spaced and well-maintained groupings separated by hardscape. And consider the use of maybe a specimen or individual shrub or tree in this zone. Of course, remember to avoid ladder fuels, uh, continue to remove any dead material or lower tree branches, right? We're gonna limb those, uh, all trees up to six feet. And you really wanna make sure you're optimizing the health of the plants in this zone. So you wanna make sure you're watering your plants regularly to maintain them. Um, and it is a county code requirement to move wood piles over 30 feet from, uh, from your buildings. Okay, so now let's move into our final defensible space zone, the zone to the 30 to 100 foot reduced fuel zone. In this zone, we really have the same bis basic principles that we had in zone one, our five to 30 foot zone. But you can include larger shrubs and trees in widely spaced groups. And of course, you wanna continue the focus of creating uh, islands of vegetation that are separated by hardscape. And ensure, of course, that you have easy access for maintenance and to continue your vigilance on ladder fuel removal. Uh, it's recommended that you might consider four to five foot wide walkways, which can help separate plantings and simplify your maintenance and, of course, help break up uh, the, the fire flowing through your property. Uh, optimally, you want to use gravel, brick, decomposed granite, or irrigated native mown grass strip, but wood mulch is okay in this zone. And the recommendation is to keep annual grasses mown to a maximum height of two to four inches County code requirement um, states that uh, annual grasses must be mown to uh, a minimum height of six inches, but not to bare ground. So as Ellie referred to, uh, it's also very important to remove any invasive plants. Uh, and this would of course apply on all your property, not, not just in the 30 to 100 foot the reduced fuel zone uh, to prevent the spread of um, these plants to neighboring properties and increasing your overall neighborhood's fire risk. 
Okay, so once you've done the work to harden your home and you've prepared your defensible space, you've moved through zero to five, five to 30 and 30 to 100, it's important to also reach out to and work with your neighbors. So your zero to 100 foot of defensible space from your home might extend in fact into a neighbor's property. So some neighborhood considerations to keep in, um, keep in account. Um, of course, starting with your own house, but to talk with your neighbors. Um, and as the Grove Street Fire uh, Safe Council is a great example of today, you wanna work together uh, and optimally develop a fuel reduction plan for your entire neighborhood. And watch for any maintenance that's needed. Um, and actually also look at what's the total vol volume of vegetation in your area. And are there any ladder fuels? So some neighborhood considerations, uh, you can consider looking at the space between the homes to minimize risk. Uh, you can think about uh, supporting biodiversity by creating habitat corridors of native plants throughout your whole neighborhood. Uh, and of course, work with your local fire department, fire safe council or firewise community. Um, there's so many wonderful COPE groups or fire safe councils that are um, starting up around the county to work as a team in better fire preparedness. Uh, and uh, your local firefighters, of course, are an excellent resource for guidance as well. Okay, so the access zone, you really want to ensure that your family, you, your family, and firefighters have clear access in and out of the property. Uh, it's important to maintain vegetation on both sides of roads and driveways. Uh, the recommendation is 10 feet from the road edge and 15 feet vertically. It is a county code requirement within 10 feet of roadway frontage to remove dead or dying vegetation, to remove tree branches up to six feet from the ground, and to, sorry, it looks like I didn't uh, get that corrected in time, to trim grasses to six inches or less, um, but not to bare soil. Uh, the county code requirement was just updated um, uh, just, just recently, so I haven't had a chance to update that slide yet. Uh, and it's important to maintain 12 feet of unobstructed pavement for um, passage of vehicles. So what will we do in, um, to make this driveway more firewise? Certainly the grass needs to be cut to six inches or less. The trees need to be limbed up uh, at a minimum of six feet from the ground. So we wanna follow those same vegetation management principles that we discussed in zone two. And if you reside in a more densely forested area, you can control fire behavior by reducing ladder fuels, opening up the canopy, and maintaining ground fuels. And this will help the firefighters with fire suppression during a fire. And of course, because uh, vegetation will regenerate in these areas, uh, re-entry re into the stand for maintenance is, will be necessary every few years. Okay, so mulch. Um, Mulch, of course, um, is organic, uh, it is combustible, um, but it also serves a really important function in our home landscapes. Uh, it conserves moisture um, and it helps with weed suppression. So it, it is a very important aspect of a sustainable landscape. Um, so uh, since or wood mulches are organic and as such combustible materials which can transmit fire, um, it's recommended to not use mulch in a widespread or continuous manner, to separate your areas mulched with these materials with non-combustible and ignition resistant materials such as concrete, gravel, rock, or a uh, native grass lawn. So composted wood chips demonstrated the least hazardous fire behavior overall of eight mulch treatments that were tested in a study by the University of Nevada at Reno and the University of California. So this is, um, uh, this rec these recommendations are supported by scientific research. Um, so it's recommended to choose compost or larger sized composted arbor mulch, um, no gorilla hair or shredded bark mulch. Those are extremely susceptible to ignition from embers. And of course, uh, no organic mulch within zero to five feet of the house. Uh, and as I mentioned before, of course, you want to separate mulched areas with non-combustible materials where possible. Okay, so much of your success depends on your ongoing maintenance of your defensible space zone, right? So we don't just do it once and then we're done. Um, uh, is, this is an ongoing effort for us every year. So um, 
uh, ongoing maintenance should be, of course, to continuously remove any dead plants and dead branches from trees and shrubs. And again, that's a county code requirement. Uh, it's recommended that you remove vines from trees and shrubs. And then annually before the fire season, you wanna mow your annual grasses and weeds to six inches tall or less, cut back woody perennials and shrubs, thin overgrown vegetation, of course, we want to do all this work um, with a lens towards the timing based on wildlife cycles. Uh, as Ellie mentioned earlier, it's optimal to do your um, pruning and vegetation thinning in fall and early winter uh, to avoid harm to bird breeding. Um, from a sustainability perspective, it's recommended that we reuse on-site materials where possible. So if you remove some trees and you have those chipped, um, uh, to then compost those to use those as mulch around your property. Uh, and then of course, again, you want a code requirement to move wood piles uh, to 30 feet or more from your buildings, cover them with fire resistant tarps and clear any surrounding vegetation. And then every few years is needed. Uh, you should go in to thin and reduce tree canopies to remove twiggy growth, maintain separation between trees and reduce the overall fuel load. Uh, again, I think we've, uh, we've uh, hammered this one in uh, into your heads, hopefully. I keep the lowest branches of your trees pruned up to at least six feet from the ground uh, and to cut back ground covers and vines to remove the buildup of dry stems and dead leaves. And of course, uh, cut back your shrubs to renew them. And uh, April will go into a little more detail on these items. So the reality is um, uh, most of us have mature existing landscapes. Um, so it's difficult to think about how can I apply this to my mature landscape. Uh, and this, these are some great graphics from East Bay Mud um, showing a, a traditional uh, grown in uh, landscape with continuous masses of shrubs, shrubs masked up against the house. Uh, we have a tree overhanging a roof uh, and a chimney and uh, tree branches growing down to the shrubs in the ground. Uh, and uh, to create a better, more um, uh, fire safe landscape, yeah, you, we uh, created, removed some of the shrubs. So shrubs are now in more distinct groupings. Uh, shrubs next to the house uh, in the zero to five foot zone have been review, re re removed. Uh, we've limbed up the trees six feet from the ground. We've provided that 10 feet of spacing um, from the stove, uh, the chimney outlet. Um, but, but you can see you still have a, a visually interesting landscape. Uh, and in terms of tree maintenance, this is another really great East Bay mud graphic that's a great illustration of recommended tree maintenance. Um, uh, of course, hopefully you'll all start looking uh, at your property with a lens to what the possible fuel load could be. Uh, here we show uh, this graphic, the East Bay mud recommendation was actually six to feet, 10 feet from the surface of the ground, but of course, County code requirements for us is six feet, uh, of course, to mow the grasses and weeds and, and to thin out the canopy. So I hope um, I've given you a basic framework for evaluating the landscape in the zero to 100 foot defensible space zone around your home. Oh, uh, sorry, a little slide management there. Um, as I've said, uh, uh, plant placement and design are key. Maintenance is essential. Uh, you wanna start at the house, do your home hardening and, and work out from there. And of course, uh, one of the uh, first things you consider is should consider after you've hardened your home is implementing that zero to five foot ember defense zone. Uh, but, but we all are, all on this team are firmly convinced that uh, it is possible to create a fire wise and sustainable landscape that incorporates beauty, safety and privacy, um, saves water and supports wildlife. And I just wanted to close by pointing out uh, that we have some uh, publications by the University of California on our webpage for our Sonoma Master Gardener program. That's our link here, uh, including the combustibility of landscape mulches study that was done. Um, some great um, publications on home hardening, uh, which we haven't really gone into at all here today, and some recommendations on home landscaping. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, my colleague April to take you through the next section. Thank you. So I, um, I've been working with native plants for about 20 years. 
and um, maybe more now, I'm aging myself, but um, I am absolutely in love with them. And so it was so exciting when Allie brought me and Mimi and I in on this group because I just, I just so enjoyed both of your presentations just now. I learn every time I watch them and um, I love how we add, you know, every time we, there's more um, material. So I'm gonna try to get through this by quarter to 12 so we can hit some more questions. So I'm gonna go over um, resilient landscapes and kind of go into more detail. It was a lot more pictures, so you can get a real feel for what these look, landscapes look like. Um, and um, so re resilient landscapes consider drought, fire development, and biodiversity as they are designed. And so it, we see this as a very complex system that California has. It's not just fire. It's, it's, we have a drought, we have drought cycles, we have um, biodiversity loss due to development. So um, I try to design gardens to look at, at everything, including um, what plant community your landscape is in, which is very important to consider. Um, and so since we have such a mix of people today um, from all over the county, we're gonna speak to, I'm gonna kind of speak to plants and plant communities that we use a lot that are really easy to adapt to your own landscape. So, um, you know, and like even that question about salvia, you know, maintenance um, of native plants is, is, is easy on some of the plants that I'm gonna talk about here, but um, I just wanted to answer that and make sure when you're doing maintenance on natives that you really leave them alone in August until right before fire season because the heat really affects them. So if you cut back grasses in late August, you might lose them or salvias because it's so hot. Um, okay, and so I, I recommend 80% natives and 20% of your favorite low water plants equal biodiversity. So your remainder could be annuals and high use water plants in pots um, or in the ember free zone. Uh, sustainability, it's really about leaving for the next generation what we have now and every generation, now we've been ramping up to using up our, our resources so quickly. Um, it, it, terrifying to me. And so when we use our gardens as a little biodiversity hotspot, um, and then if we can get more and more of these gardens all over the urban and the, the wildland interface, we can really bring back, like like Ellie was saying um, that about the talk, um, about the book, Talami's work about these islands and um, having a, a good percentage of native plants. Um, in the landscape. And we don't have scientific inf um, uh, information yet about how many plants or what kind of square footage equals biodiversity. And I'm hoping that new research will start coming out so we can get some more of a handle on how big these gardens need to be. Um, but at least, you know, reducing lawns by 50% uh, is, is crucial. Um, so why do you use native plants? Of course, like this is an image of salvias and poppies in a beautiful hedgerow in the back there is salt bush, um, quail bush, some people call it. But using um, these plants, they create, they support the food web, they're sustainable, they're resilient, like I talked about, they can tolerate the drought, the drought cycle and the rain cycles. They're even adapted to fire um, and they're really beautiful. So I'm just going to go through some of what Mimi talked about on the zones, just to give you some examples, and then we're going to jump into the plant material towards the end. But I just want to show you some that you don't just have to have just like lava rock in your front yard. You can use these zones um, in a different way and really create a gorgeous garden that is that does follow these firewise um, samples. So. Um, Decorative rock and boulders. I use a lot of this crushed rock. This is crushed Trinity rock. Um, it's 3 h inch. Um, and then we use a lot of steel header. So in that zero to five is a great zone for, for boulders. This one was cut and shined up. Um, this is another, just a simple fountain for wildlife. Um, and then containers. This could be a place, like I said, where you could put your annuals and your favorite little plants in pots, kind of spread out. Um, we also use a lot of Nomo Fescue, which is a, a there's a couple of companies um, doing it now, but since Amy was saying about the you know, four to six inches is your maximum, this 
they call it no mow, but you can mow it and keep it really low and lush with a lot less water. So this is a plant that you could use to have some green up against your house in the zero to five as well. Then we use Trinity Pebble and um, Steel Edging to, um, to complete that look. Um, more pebble, um, pebble softened. You know, you don't always have to have these hard edges, but you can have some soft plantings along the edge after your zero, after your five foot. And this is a lovely shower. This was in a, a burn zone up at Mark West. I, I saw that we had some participants from that area. And so this garden we put in as they were rebuilding. And so it was able to be established by the time they moved back into their house. This is a fountain grove rebuild um, with a pathway with more of a nomo fescue over there at the house corner edge, just to soften the green. Sometimes it's hard people, you know, like Mimi was saying, like foundation shrubs are really what we are so used to and um, in the look of it. And so softening that edge is really challenging. And also the real, the realities, here she put in some pots with her, um, her annuals for color. And then we used arbor mulch two inches or less in this zone, um, in this landscape, this front yard. Um, for, for, it was funny for permitting we had you have to do three inches three inches or more of mulch but there you know so nobody comes around and like measures your mulch depth so so you can keep it at two inches and it serves all the purposes of saving water and being more fire safe um, just another nice example this is lipia ground cover um, so there's a new product called carapia that I don't know too well um, I haven't used before, but it doesn't spread into the into the wildlands. So just be careful when using Lipia that, in, that you select the one native to California, which is a little harder to find. And then it's a great butterfly nectar plant. And so if it does escape into your garden, into other areas of your garden, it's a really beautiful brown cover. She did more. This was from Native Valley Design, a, a Napa um, designer, and she just did more of a modern. You know, you don't have to do everything all naturalistic either with natives. You can play around with being more modern in, in their layout. Um, this is not native as well, but it, this is the zero to five with some large flagstone. So here's another plant that you could, it, that if you keep it hydrated, it can work on, on some of the house. So what I would do is you really can't stand having like pebble around your whole zero to five. Um, and this is where the designer comes in and me and and Mimi talked a lot about code, but I'm kind of going into to what you know some some little ways that you can soften the edges. Um, so zero to five, you could use you know some of these lower ground covers with um, with flagstone, but I wouldn't do this around the whole house. Maybe on the west side of your house and keep the east side um, the zero to five completely clear. This is that Nomo fescue, and this is a good maintenance slide. Um, this, it, once it, when it did go to seed, because she planted it in four inch instead of as the turf version. Um, so you can get it in four inch containers like at Emerisa. Um, but she's gonna have to cut this down to six inches and keep on that um, through the fire, the, the morning the fire seasons. And the fire seasons are, are happening more of the year. So, um, they're gonna get in there and cut this back, even though it's really pretty and you can use this grass in this way further out in the, in the, in the 30 to 100. But um, at the edge of the house, just make sure you're work, like watching your maintenance and keeping the seed heads um, cut. This is a pathway that um, with, with gravel and um, that Trinity mixed together, but underneath it's a swale to, for water management on the site. So you can play around with these these um, sustainable elements, but this the swale doesn't have to be completely obvious. Um, let's see, uh, in the zero to five for existing trees, I like to point out, we talk about oaks a lot um, and trees. A lot of you have existing homes with giant oaks over your house. And that's when you just need to consider the limbing up, you know, to, the, to at least six feet above your house and making sure that you're intensely careful um, during fire season. This client had um, hired us right before the Kincaid fire and his diligence to clean all the, you know, clean up the um, leaf litter. Get, he had got sprinklers set up. He did, I'll talk about irrigation later, but some sprinklers that he could run when the fire was near and, um, and uh, pulled out all of the plants around the zero to five zone. And I'm, I, I will, I, 
really wish I had gotten pictures of as he did it. But as these workshops evolve, we'll get more maintenance um, photos. Um, and then so so looking at that systemic approach, you know, trees save energy and they cool your house in the in the summer. And um, so you can use deciduous trees. But again, that's, the deciduous trees are have a lot of leaf litter that you're going to need to clean in the fire season. Um, design five to 30. So we're moving out from that edge and into the five to 30 where you can have more plant material in islands. Um, this is a swale planted with plantings along it. And this is a good example. Um, since this slide, we actually went back in and took out the plants on the left side of the swale right up against the house and put in more um, uh, gravel at, on the edge of the swale. And I actually, this was a, another drainage issue, but if you don't have a drainage issue right at your house, I would put swales definitely at least 10 feet out from your, from your, um, your home. But they're a great way to sink water into the soil and provide um, moisture for habitat as well, because all of our little critters really need moisture in the garden as well. Um, some more examples of ways to, to look at these new landscapes, the new way we look at, at fire safe, fire wise landscapes is um, looking at driveways and sidewalks and auto courts as your places to break up the planting. So, you, you know, so that there is that, that as Ellie was talking about um, in Mimi too, you know, the, the, the width between the plant material is safe to slow down fire. Um, paths and swales, a separation of islands. So this island idea, I know it's come up with both Mimi and Ellie, but thinking about your garden and can, in a way that you can separate, you can make these fire breaks beautiful, but you also can get enough plant material for habitat. And so the key is to have masses of plants versus just one of a species if you're looking for a habitat garden. Um, and so, and then looking at these species that are really high impact pollinator plants <laughs> and bird plants, that's a lot of big mouthful, but like buckwheats, and monkey flowers and grasses. Um, you, you, want, you really want to have some shrub cover for birds. Um, so, so it really is a, a complex, um, system that you're creating and designing in that five to 30 foot because you don't want a ton of plant material um, and you want a lot of spaces, but you also want to get some habitat happening in your landscape. So we use masses of low growing plants a lot. Um, this is gum plant down the yellow in the corner. It's a very, it's almost like a succulent and then um, California fuchsia. Um, Rain gardens, as I said, like keep those out 10 feet, but this is a beautiful way to look at our rainy season. I love, you know, since we don't get a lot of rain, um, it's so fun to actually see it in the garden when it happens. And then you're, you're refilling your aquifer and recharging the ground, especially if you have a well. And um, a lot of our landscapes um, are draining with the vineyards and all the, the development are really draining our aquifers. And so wherever I can, we try to design in some place for the water to passively fill and then drain. And I've never seen these back up with water and get any kind of mosquitoes or anything. People oftentimes worry about that. And um, it's just, an, it's a really wonderful feature and it, 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 the water drains out. You just don't want to make them more than a few feet. More swales. This is kind of an overdone, like a big full swale. Um, or, but you can, you can just do them even with like a low place in the landscape, like a berm swale as well, and mulch them. Um, design 30 to 100. So this is where we see the opportunity to have a little bit more um, height. And, and this is where you can, you can really add maybe a few toy on or a few shrubs in the middle of your island, making sure that as you can design it so you have maybe you know maybe a 10 foot by six foot island with some nice big um, pathways in between and those pathways we'll talk about more in a minute what goes on those pathways um, more heart habitat this is that same mark west residence where we use we have a big island of plants that, that's linear and then we we broke it up with a nice big pathway running through the garden so so just a 
so that you don't have to, so it, it, the garden is safe and slows down the fire, but also has a lot of habitat value and cover, especially everybody loves the birds and birds just will not come to your garden unless there's cover and some layering in the landscape. So um, we don't see birds coming in on these habitat gardens so much, you know, at actually inhabiting them until we get that shrub cover or tree cover happening. Um, what to use between the masses of plants. Uh, Mimi mentioned arbor mulch. This is what I depend on from, from five to 100. Um, oftentimes in the, in the five to 30, we still use some, a lot of um, rock mulch, but arbor mulch is, is thinly um, laid at two inches or less is a safe option. And it really supports the soil structure. So a lot of mulches are just chipped, um, chipped wood. And arbor mulch is a composted product that's heated up to get the weeds out of it. And it, so it really, it breaks down a little faster, but I find that it really um, supports the soil structure in your garden. And that's really, there's so much new research coming out that we, we, we just don't know what's all about the soil structure and about soil life um, as much as we really should. And I'm seeing that the gardens that we really nurture the soil, not adding compost, like actual compost to native gardens typically because they could get it gives it it's just too um too much nutrients for them and a lot of times they'll grow really fast in a rich soil and then and then burn out young so i always say like go with the native soil or lean soil and then use arbor mulch to support that soil structure um, mowed california native bunch grass or well-maintained ground cover can be another great choice for these breaks in these islands in the 30 to 100. So just some other options that you can use. Um, and you just wanna make sure you're not leaving bare soil, especially on a steep slope, because it's gonna run off and cause all kinds of erosion issues. So you're going in and you're following all these rules, and then you have the, all these really big open, you know, bare land. And so you will, to keep those weeds out and to keep the broom out and all the invasives, you really wanna treat that open space in between the islands with some with one of these options. This is a house I saw up in the Bennett Ridge. Um, uh, Elliot mentioned that we did a, our first talk up there in person. I miss seeing you people in person. Um, and hopefully we'll get back to that. But that was our only in-person workshop. And I was driving, this house is for sale up there. So I didn't, I knew I wasn't gonna offend anybody too much, but this is kind of a perfect storm um, landscape that we can look at where they planted these columnar um, junipers and then have a wood little wall and some shrubs up in there. And then this big like normal turf grass in the front yard that's gonna use a ton of water. So this was a good example, like it would be easy to fix this problem. Just take out those junipers, make sure you get some rock mulch instead of the plants in that zero to five. And you can replace this wall with some stone wall and then, you, and then replace the turf with native plants and you've got a habitat garden that's fire wise. So it's not, it's not, it, it's around the house envelope, you know, it takes us letting go of that foundation plant issue, but um, you can really you know, quickly make a big impact on something like this. So with drought, fire and native plants and irrigation, irrigation is a really a tough, um, a tough one for me as a designer and installer and um, and manager of these urban uh, demonstration gardens. So our demonstration gardens, we hand water because um, number one, there wasn't a lot of funding for installation um, of irrigation. And if you look on our website, Habitat Corridor Project, you can see where these demonstration gardens are. Um, lately, I, with, we've been looking at this this new system called the MP Rotator. It's not new, uh, but it's as a replacement for drip. Um, it is a low water use solution that covers the ground and covers the plant leaves with water, which is what they really want in the summer. Their stomata get clogged with dust and um, they really want like an overhead shower. And so we use less, less um, timing, like, like once a week, and give the plants a good shower for the first couple summers after they go in. And then after that, we cut it back to about once a month, depending on how hot the summer is, because these plants are really adapted to our drought, you know, our summer dry months. So they can really take a long period of not having water. 
that with climate, climate change, we're seeing heightened temperatures in the summer. And so you do need to give your plants a little bit of water indefinitely. Um, and so a lot of times these are nice if you have a lawn and you're converting it, that you can just convert the heads over to these Hunter MP rotators and get, a, they like lay a nice little finger, and I don't know how to describe it, but they just water without a lot of trans, uh, eva evapotranspiration happening. Um, so, so this is one option we've been using a lot. It also um, gives you the opportunity if you still, if you're on a, a in one of the red flag days or you're having to evacuate or you need to so soak things that down in your landscape because it's a fight it's a red flag day you can run this system and just quickly soak everything down versus I have a lot of clients in the during the evacuations you know trying to pack up their car and water down the landscape um, so it's it's a great option for all these crazy things going on in our, our state um, or this is the Living Learning Landscapes project at the junior college that I'm working on with Mimi, the UC Master Gardeners, and the, the, the Sonoma Water. And we have demonstration gardens there, and they're going in over the next year, more of them. But this was a crew helping us, um, of volunteers, um, putting down a drip irrigation system in a grid. So it, it covers the soil as well. And then you plant into this. We put down cardboard, and then we laid down the um the, the grid of drip and then the plants will go in and the mulch on top so it it still hydrates the whole lot of the whole ground and not just the little plants with the drip irrigation heads on each plant then you're just irrigating that little plant and the whole ground the ground around it is not is drying out and it has it has, it's losing all that life that, that it needs water for so this is just another system on, on this website, we have free plans of these systems um, for typical residential homes. So you can kind of see how they work, what the parts are. And there's also uh, eight different landscapes, um, planting designs that you can download um, and use in your garden. Uh, so tips for successful habitat planting. I know I've talked about some of this already. Um, having many types of flowers, you know, the uh, plant flowers can be a tube, there can be an umbel, there are like these daisy shapes. So like really thinking about having a lot of variety in the types of flowers. Um, large groupings, we call them pollinator targets. So making sure that maybe you cut down your, your variety of plants if you don't have like huge of space to make sure you have five of, the, of these different plant plants. Um, flowering at different times and plants that provide both nectar and pollen sources. Now, this is woolly sunflower. It is a lovely ground cover that is just like this bright little bloomer pretty much all year round. It stays really low to the ground and covers about four feet. Um, some of our favorite plants, or my favorite plants, um, the salvias, sages. Um, this is Sonoma sage. It's a ground cover. Um, for you know from the Sonoma area and where the chaparral zone up on the hill up there in the heat so it can take some really hot temperatures um, I noticed that it still needs water in the summer in the landscape um, and uh, let's see and the salvias as we talked about before can be cut to the ground periodically they're actually a, a that's one of their their adaptations to fire um, is that they're used to fire coming through and every five years or so um, you know Get, getting rid of the, you know, getting rid of all their leaves and everything. So I found that most of them can be cut back depending on how old they are and how often you do it. And some big habitat value plant species. Um, I wanted to, so buckwheats, California fuchsias, but I wanted to talk to you about that, that um, each of these plants have cultivars that have been selected from different areas or hybridized. So you can have a buckwheat that is five feet tall, which is the, the plant on the left. This is a ground cover buckwheat or a ground cover buckwheat. This is Eriogonum warren, warren or little, which is another favorite of mine right now. Um, blooming right now, very drought tolerant. Um, California fuchsia is the same thing. You can get one that's three feet tall and kind of rangy looking and then another cultivar that is low and low and very, um, uh, well behaved in the garden. So that's this one on the right. Um, I think this one is Epilobium calistoga. So um, thinking about that when you go select your plants, make sure you know, you know how big it's gonna get. 
Another habitat thing that I do is leave seed heads or flowers for fall colors and for the birds. So oftentimes we're so fastidious in the garden and it's really important to leave a little mess um, and leave the, the seed heads on. The buckwheat seed heads turn this wonderful autumn brownish auburn um, in the fall. Um, depending on maintenance, back to, you know, fire season, keeping things tidy. So there is like that, it's a, it's a, it's a balance. California native shrub and ground covers. Um, so we depend on ground covers and shrubs in the garden to make that structure. Um, this is coyote brush and leafless sage. Um, the shrubs, like I said, are really important in the garden. And that's why we've, had, we've been working on these workshops for a whole, you know, over a year now, really diving in deep with the fire officials and, um, and talking about, and our partners in the fire agencies, talking about like how can we get some of these shrubs in here that are critical, but also be fire safe and fire wise. And that's why we came up with the islands idea with the space between them. So you can get some more heights happening in your landscape. Hoyan was really, is there, came back beautifully after the fires um, and it's, it can be tacked back every year and just fluffed back out again if you, if you are trying to keep it more, um, less woody. Um, coffee berry, Mount San Bruno, it's a wonderful cultivar in the coffee berries that's a tidier and a little bit better behaved in the garden, um, covered with beautiful berries. Uh, and, and these coffee berries just get covered in pollinators when they're blooming. They just get these little white flowers. They don't really show up, but you just go near it and it's buzzing with life. I'm looking at under the oaks, uh, you want to be really cognizant, as was mentioned before, about not watering in the summer under the oak. So in the shadier landscapes, you don't really need to, to give these plants water in the summer if you pick the right plants, like um, hummingbird sage, the California iris doesn't need water in the summer, can go under the oaks. This is um, at the bottom middle is a ground cover called yerba buena, um, really beautiful green that, that can, um, be planted at the edge of the oak um, understory because you really don't want to plant like right under the oaks either. You want to give them, if you can, to the drip line um, so that they that, that what the oaks want is their natural leaf litter. And it really is hard to plant right under them. They have so much leaf litter um, happening. Um, spice bush is a wonderful large calicanthus occidentalis. It's a large spread flower, um, kind of riparian plant that I find tolerates a, a good bit of drought, you know, and I, I water, I live in Sebastopol and I water my spice bush maybe once a month and, um, and it's in full sun. So in a shadier situation, they, they, you find them along riparian areas as well. So even in our riparian plant community here in California, especially in the snow of the valley, most of the streams don't run all year. So the riparian plants really need to, they have adapted as well to be able to tolerate the summer dry and, and they send their roots down super far to reach for that, for the, um, for the water. And that's another thing about native plants that is so amazing is that their root structure underneath is two thirds its top. So you have this giant um, root structure for the small top. So I would say like give the plants a couple years to, they, they really pump into that, that root structure of the root first two years and then they switch to um, flowering and growing, you know, more full on the top. So these biodiversity islands, I just like to show everybody one that's kind of, that really works in almost any garden um, in, in Sonoma County. And so this combination, and we're gonna post these slides um, on our website and get them to you, but um, having a coffee berry or a toy on so that you have a shrub top, and having a sage in it, Salvia clevelandii is this purple one. It, it can be kind of short lived, but it gives you so much gorgeousness um, while it's living and, you, and um, then you can replace it um, or use one of the other, um, other salvias. Uh, California fuchsia, a manzanita or two. Um, you don't wanna have too many manzanitas in the zero to 30 zone, but a couple are fine in the hummingbirds in the winter feeding that the manzanita um, provides is very important in a habitat garden in Sonoma County. Um, some ground covers maybe at the edge. 
but then you can get that lower going to higher in the middle of the island. Monkey flower mixed with some grasses. Monkey flower doesn't do great on its own, but it does fabulously mixed amongst some grasses for a little more structure and coolness. That's kind of the secret to monkey flower working well. And then this is my why, back to our why. This is my son when he was little laying out plants and our, you know, the future generations are going to enjoy these gardens and all the wildlife and habitat that, that we're supporting. So the more we can convert even a small place, like a small area like this 20 by 50 kind of space in front of a high school can become an, a wonderful enriching um, habitat and educational opportunity. So I hope you guys will, people will go visit some of our demonstration gardens and get to know these plants. And um, now that's it on mine. And make sure to go check, like Ellie said, make sure to go check out uh, the our Sonoma Resilient Landscapes.com and habitatcorridorproject.org for more information um, about landscapes because really going to see them and getting to know the plants, um, I'm sure you'll all fall in love with them. Thank you, April. That was beautiful. I love your slides. Sure. In Sonoma Valley, there's the uh, demonstration garden. Um, it's it's near the high school and along Nathanson Creek. So that's a good way to look at some of the plants. And That's a beautiful garden. Um, I wish we knew the address. We'll make sure to post that. Yeah, we should. Okay, I can look that up and post it. Um, and the Sonoma Ecology Center is actually developing an extensive nursery that actually has the species, the, the, the local species. And when we talk about native plants, mm -hmm. California, you know, California native plants, well, California is a huge state. It's like the equivalent of Maryland to Florida. So obviously I'm from the East Coast. So, <laughs> it, you know, it would be ideal to get plants from locally, regionally native, which would be Bay Area or even better Sonoma Valley. And the Ecology Center is developing a, a wonderful nursery for that. And there are other nurseries. That's locally. fabulous. Really great. If you can find plants that are more local to your area, the be it's better. Nat the go native and then go local next um, as much as you can. And it's great to see nurseries um, start starting to jump into that space. Um, on the questions, there's one question that keeps getting asked and that's about deer, res deer resistant and fire safe plants and my suggestion was since we don't have a fire resistant list to link to deer resistant lists and say from those lists to to check on the uh, how the plant thrives how the plant grows so I give it to you yeah so it really is more thinking about the design and maintenance principles that we talked about so the design principles are about the islands um, about plant spacing um, and about using hardscape to break up break up planted areas where you can. So it's, it's less about <clears throat> the plant selection. Of course, plant selection for deer resistance is critical. <laughs> it's never a guarantee, as we all. Tricky. Deer resistant is tricky. Absolutely. Deer resistant is very tricky. Um, so I would focus on choosing from a deer resistant list, knowing it's not a guarantee and then thinking about how you're placing the plants and what other hardscape elements you're including and thinking about the different zones. And they, okay. tend, they tend to, deers tend to not like the stinky plants like salvias um, and then the buckwheats as well with little fine leaves, but out of the nursery, you're gonna have to protect everything because they'll eat it when it's nice and fresh out of the nursery. Yeah, apparently what uh, the thing is with deer don't remember what they don't like. <laughs> so they don't bite every plant you have. <laughs> until they go, oh, we don't like this one. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. And also, please do go to our website, sonomaresilientlandscapes.com, because we have a lot of conversation and we actually have plant lists there. They're not fire resistant plant lists. We actually look more at where the plant is located relative to the house. And in, in terms of the zero to five, five to 30 and so on. And in general, we're not recommending junipers, right? And there really are some plants that really, that, that while we're not saying what is fire resistant, there are a handful of the dirty dozen which are really fire problematic, like Rosemary, juniper. Rosemary, lavender. <laughs> right, yeah. but, but oftentimes it's not only a function of um, if, if they're oily or resinous, but, uh, but about maintenance. And um, like juniper, for example, over years will develop a lot of dead woody mass underside that you don't even see from the top. So it's really 
it's as much about the maintenance and kind of the characteristics of the plant than um, uh, that you need to consider. Okay. Um, the next question is if the roof is metal, is it still a fire hazard to have a tree branches overhanging the metal roof? Well, first of all, I, I should mention first, uh, that the, count, the county does not, and, and fire regulations don't require removal of trees that overhang or branches that overhang. The problem is that the, the, the debris that can collect, and even on a windy, you may have just cleaned it, but the wind will come up during a firestorm and or a, a fire of any kind, and more things will land on it. But that's so yeah, but a metal roof is one of the most fire resistant. The problem is if you if embers can still get up underneath a metal roof. So that's it's not so much a question of the leaf litter, which is is one question, but the embers, which is another question. Okay. Um, what about I, I might I might just point out as a part of that is that uh, gutters are still critical even if you have a metal roof you've got to clean those gutters out and uh, and or put on screens but even if you put on screens those can accumulate debris and that can in turn start a fire but if you've got a gutter full of uh, combustible debris you've basically got a trench fire all along your roof line so yeah. even metal roof yeah just great throw that in. great point Dave and in fact there's pictures and videos of firefighters yanking gutters off of houses, you know, while they're on fire with all that debris and material in there. So that, that's a really great point. Thanks for that. Actually, that's one of the first things you should be doing on red flag days is cleaning out the gutters yep. or, or in the summer season in general. Yep, sweeping up the, around the zero to five foot. Yep, making sure there anything combustible is away, yeah. Uh, one question that keeps coming up is about the plants in front of fences around the house. Um, should you have the five foot zone around the fence as well? Um, we, we um, as Mimi said, we're trying to get away from wood fences, but if you have a wood fence, I would give it some room for sure. Um, even, even if it's all, you know, let's say it runs along your property line, I would, I would hit the zones in the same way, giving space between the plants and not having a foundation planting along the fence like we've always done before. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So it, it's really about, uh, hopefully the content in the presentation today has given you kind of a new lens for looking at your own home landscape. Um, and hopefully that lens includes including native plant materials to help support our you know, biodiversity, which is so critically important for us. But ho hopefully also gives you a lens for looking at um, how fire might move through your landscape and, and how much kind of woody mass you might have or flammable, you know, mass, biomass that you might have that would contribute it to carrying that fire. So it's not like we, ha it's not like we're one stop shopping with answers for every question you might have. Each landscape is really individual and you need to look at your own landscape and think about um, uh, what the, you know, how fire might move through that and how you might be contributing to that by massing a bunch of woody shrubs in front of a, a wood fence, right? So it is, it's trying to, to give you a different lens for looking at your home landscape. And I also wanted to mention that we do have a consultation component. We can't handle like a hundred consultations, but um, we do offer that as a group and, and please email us um, and we can try to fit in some time to actually look at your own landscape. The Sonoma Ecology Center has some staff that can do that. And, and we have different people. So like, like Mimi said, it is so individual. Um, that was the second, the next question. You, Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, are broom and genestra the same thing? Are they considered native plants? We're all shaking our heads. <laughs> no, so I think genesta, I think, is the genus for well, the our, broom family. It was a genus for, of many of the broom plants in the yeah. broom. Um, I don't think there's any native broom in California. For sure, French yeah. broom and Scotch broom that you see that are so invasive, I mean, it's everywhere, is non-native. Um, it's not endemic to California. Okay. Yeah, and it's really hard to get rid of. And, you know, it's that's really a huge fire issue in Sonoma County. Yeah, it, it, that's, that's a long-term undertaking to, to manage larger stands of broom. I, I will plug the Ecology Center. Jason Mills is the... <laughs> the restoration 
program manager has been removing broom in large amounts, acres and acres of broom. There have been some funding programs for it currently. I don't believe there is anything. And I know that you're listening, Jason, because you put in the chat uh, about the Nathanson Creek demonstration garden, which is on uh, the corner of MacArthur in East 2nd Street. It's a great place to see plants. Right. But Jason, if you are here and want to speak up about uh, broom, if we I have I don't time. think he can if he's not a presenter. Yeah, um, he, he can, can answer in the chat area. Yeah, yeah, he can just answer in the chat. Okay. okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, somebody has a five acre property in Mark West Springs Road. And they're asking, would redwoods thrive in this area? No. No, redwoods are only a coastal plant these days, and I would not plant them past, say, Sebastopol corridor um, to be, and let, you know, you're going to have to water them a ton, and they just, that's just not their habitat any longer. They, they like, um, they, they actually require a good deal of fog, and that's, that's actually how they water themselves during the summertime. So you tend to find them on, in, on the coast in west-facing canyons where the fog just pours in, and when you're further inland, um, east-facing canyons where it's cooler and the fog will settle. But definitely not the Mark. Mark West is inland and more west-facing. Yeah, as and even right. existing redwood trees, I mean, we have, you know, you really have to give them a lot of water because um, they can, they don't, they're, they don't burn the same way like oaks, but if they're dried out and you, have, you end up with a lot of material, like dead material on them, um, find them succeeding in like a lawn at a school. Um, Santa Rosa, but yeah. Screening trees, I've been using, um, a screening seems to come up a lot. And so we use um, ironwood a lot. It's a, co it's a, an island plant that has kind of that look of a redwood. Okay. Is it true that living mulch of certain low growing ground covers like Phila nodiflora and Lipia repens can be used fairly widely instead of wood-based mulch with greater fire safety? I would say that's a really uh, drought tolerant and really um, moist, you know, it's very low and it, it stays hydrated. It doesn't have dry leaves. I'm looking at it at my garden right now. And I would say it would be a really wise choice to use as, with that invasive kind of lens on that it, it some people are a little, are concerned that it's, it's spreading out of its area. Okay, uh, another question is about the compost from green waste, the stuff that looks like soil, not composted bark. So that's compost, isn't it? If it looks like soil. Yeah. You seem to indicate that this would be fire safe and a good choice is mulch. Do you know where to get it? Um, I'm trying I to see don't the know question. exactly what they're talking about. Maybe they're talking about the arbor mulch or just compost. I think just um, compost. Yeah, I think just standard compost versus arbor mulch has larger chunks in it and variety. It has leaves and such, and yeah. compost is just very finely composted. <laughs> One of the things that has come up about, about any kind of composted mulch is that it can, if you, and we recommend not putting it for more than two to at the most three inches because while it will not burn with a flame, it will smolder and it can be really hard. So, so all of those, those composted mulches are actually better than, than wood, a large wood chip mulch, but it's still, you want to keep it at least five feet from your house because yeah. it's hard to see that it's burning and it's hard to put out and you don't want it climbing onto your and you know into your home <laughs> yeah. and don't get confused between composted mulch and compost compost is more is finer composted mulch you should not put near the uh in the zero to five zone correct yeah and so they were asking where to get it um uh, grab and grow has it yeah be careful with grab and grow i love grab and grow but i've gotten a lot of mulch from them with some weed weeds in it with um, the morning glory that's really an invasive weed right now. Um, Find but, weed! <laughs> the, the, um, yeah, or, or um, SBI, Wheeler's Amarone, any of these places. Yep, probably. there's lots of yeah. lots of landscape supply lots of, yeah. in Sonoma County, yeah. Okay, uh, how do you create a hedgerow to create privacy from your neighbors while keeping proper spacing between plants? 
Well, I would think in terms of, a, 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 um, of the island going the opposite way as we think. So thinking of, of that hedgerow as an island with the spaces, just like Mimi was saying, like using this, this lens of, of, of fire wise landscaping. Um, so getting some of those head, those larger shrubs in and hedgerows are great because you can mix a bunch of different shrubs um, and get a ton of habitat value in that space. Um, somebody's asking about the dirty dozen. Do you want to list them or do we want to refer people to the dirty dozen or what is our opinion on the dirty dozen? It's an old movie, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was the one who said that, and I um, I don't write, write, I mean, basically, in the same token that all plants will burn, it's also true that all plants can actually be maintained in a way that is more fire-wise. So it, you could have a juniper, and I know Nancy Kerwin actually has a large area of juniper that she turned into a wonderful uh, maze for her, I think it's grandchildren, but it's, it's pruned up, it's, it's almost like bonsai juniper, but we don't recommend doing that. And if you do it, it should be way as far away from the house as possible. But juniper is certainly one for, for people who really aren't interested in doing maintenance. Um, you don't want your juniper, you don't want rosemary, um, you don't want some of the Italian cypress. Those all are plants that just their natural growth in, encourages deep, dense, and very highly flammable vegetation. So th those are the three or four that I could think of right now. Um, others tend to be in the, um, the chaparral type communities, native plants. And so things like red shank and chemise, which are chaparral plants, that you can still have them if you live in the chaparral, you wanna be really careful about having them in your zero to 30 zone, but there, there is guidance out there about managing it. So you, you go in and you prune it up, you get out all the dead wood, and you make sure that there's a lot of spacing as much as possible between. But you really, a lot of those landscapes are steeply sloped and highly erosive. So it's very important to be careful about that. Yeah, and so I, you wanna speak on that, Roberta. I guess I, I would say, if I could just add some thoughts to Ellie's, um, so it's really about trying to think about some of the key um, zones we talked about today. So um, think about five to 30, think about low growing um, grasses, perennials, um, maybe you include a shrub specimen, you know, specimen shrub or like a specimen, perhaps arctostaphylus shrub or a specimen tree for shade, which can be such a hugely important aspect on energy conservation. And then moving out into the 30 to 100, looking at larger masses of shrubs and trees, not larger, but, but larger size masses of shrubs and trees. But it's just, it's about kind of rethinking your design in your landscape. It's not about, we're trying to get people away from vilifying a specific plant. So someone asked, is bottle brush part of the dirty dozen? Um, you know, think about your plant in terms of the design aspects that we've talked about in the zones um, and think about them, look at them with a lens to maintenance. Do they develop a lot of dead woody twigs or branches on the interior? Are you going to have to be maintaining that on a regular basis? It's really thinking about that lens and how much woody mass it might contribute to a fire than about vilifying any specific plant. I don't know, does that help? <laughs> Okay. So, so we are at about, uh, we are at our 12 o'clock uh, cutoff point, but uh, I think we have a consensus that all of our panelists and experts are okay with going a little over. If we have some additional questions uh, that haven't been answered, there's plenty, there is some time. So uh, stick with us. Okay. There was a repeat question about the uh, water agency mulch. It, is it okay? I'm not specifically familiar with the mulch that the water agency provides. I'm sure it's chipped trees. I can't imagine that it's, that there's- the a, city of Santa Rosa has a mulching program maybe. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't used it, so I can't yeah. say. Mm -hmm. 
what if there is a deck between the house and the first garden space? Will the county start the zero to five zone from the house or the deck? Okay, first of all, the okay. zero to five is not a county code requirement. Yeah. Right. So the, our presentations will be on the web on our, our website, and I think Grove Street's gonna put them on their website. Um, so look, if, if you look to the presentation that I did, it's only the stuff that's highlighted in red that's a county code requirement. I highly recommend everybody go to the county website and download the, um, the ordinance and read it and understand it for yourself. We're trying to help you with guidance on that, but I, I think it would be really important for everyone to do that. Uh, is a, a wood deck, well, maybe we should ask, you know, uh, Roberta to speak to wood decks adjacent to the house. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you're, it sounds like if it's a wood deck, like an island separate from the house is kind of how I'm understanding the question. It would still be treated as if, um, I think as if it was a structure. So you still want to have your zero to five foot around that deck um, mm -hmm. is how I would look at it. Same with an outbuilding or an accessory structure. That's still a structure. So your zero to five foot would still count as around that structure. Now, also I want to mention real quick, um, that reminds me, same with RVs. If you've got an RV parked on your property, put that zero to five foot around your RV parking area as well. Don't expect that you can you know, treat that any differently than a structure. So that, that's my belief. And I believe that's probably um, if you live in any entities where they have a local regulation with regard to the zero to five, I would consider a deck as an island separate from the house as a structure same as the RV. If I was a code official, I'd be treating that as if it were a structure. Um, I think we've answered all the questions. Unless anybody sees any specific question that we answered in the with uh, writing in where we typed an answer that maybe the answer wasn't satisfactory. Um, a number of people asked about wildflowers. What kind of uh, wildflowers to plant? And I suggested the Facilla Clarkia, and then uh, Ellie suggested that on our webpage there's a formula for uh, creating a, a meadow. Is that right, April? I think so. I think that's one of our plant lists. We have a bunch of plant lists on there um, just to, to start you all off with some good combinations. Okay. But looking at your local Native Plant Society, um, and the, they oftentimes have plant lists and and, um, and plant sales, as well as like Sonoma Ecology Center. So that's native wildflowers is some a way you can really get local and try to get seed sources from your area. I mean, Priscilla, this year is, is a really great. good one. Yeah. For those of you who are left, I, I, and, and those of you who aren't here, it's, I really want to encourage everyone to respond to the survey. It'll take you like less than a minute at the end, you're going to get an email with a survey. It will really help us target how we do our presentations in the future. And we will be doing many more of these, we hope. And if you know people who want these presentations, let us know. And if you liked what you saw, you can please donate to the Sonoma Ecology Center, the Habitat Corridor Project, uh, the Grove Street Fire Safe Council. I don't know if you see and the master gardener program yes. <laughs> we're also self-sustaining we um, there's a don't there's a donate button on our homepage on our website that's right uh, we'll there is a question uh, of uh, i think we we said how do you get rid of broom and that's done like uh, ellie was saying that you have a, a broom removal process uh team right well J jason actually wrote in the chat uh, broom is best to remove manually during the rainy season. It's actually really easy to pull out. I pulled out, I helped with pulling out a couple of acres of broom. Uh, it, it's good to do it before February when the birds are nesting. And then you just pull it out and, and you can actually, strangely enough, scatter it around because there's not that much biomass or, or take it out depending on where it is. And but the seed bank will then you'll get more the next year but it actually doesn't set seed for a couple of years so that you can just keep pulling it out and it, but it's a it's a long I mean, it's just it's a community project and the local sure. our local native plant society the milo baker has broom pullers that you can borrow for these big wrenches that really are cr critical in pulling out broom so so a lot of some agencies i don't know if the snow ecology center owns some too but um 
it's it's a key tool in that process. And, and then I also wanted to um, recommend to folks, I did a couple of links in the chat on broom removal and poison oak removal from the University of California Integrated Pest Management site. So if you just Google UC space IPM, um, you can pick the landscape section and do a search and it provides you um, guidelines uh, on both those and many other topics um, with the lens to pest management of course that Ellie referred to earlier which is um, you know minimizing use of herbicides and pesticides if at all possible is, is only a last resort um, I, this we we answered it earlier that um, we, you could find a consultation from either April or uh, the ecology center somebody's looking for a consultation because just e email our email link um, uh, Resilient Landscapes Coalition at gmail.com and we will parcel you out to the right agency and person and Yeah, and, and to the question about um, many commercial landscapers are not knowledgeable that that's part of our coalition's hopefully longer one of our longer term goals is to Not only help educate our community, but to um, educate landscape professionals as well um, uh, So and nurseries and it's there's a lot of opportunity for 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 education on this topic so that, that's some of our longer term goals and a lot of the questions i put a link to the um to the uh on our website we have a uh, description of each of the mulches for each of the zones and a mulching recommendations so that link is on the uh, I included it a couple of times I recommend people save this chat as well before we close out because there's a lot of critical wonderful information yeah. And you could save the chat by going on the bottom where you see the three dots in the uh, chat area and it has a save chat where the three dots are and you could save it and it will be saved on your desktop. And um, you could find it in your finder. Dave, do you see any questions? Oh, there's one open question. Sorry, I just looked away for a second. Uh, uh, can you apply these guidelines to dense urban neighborhoods such as Oakmont? These guidelines would denude these landscapes. Yeah, so for sure you want, you know, I would think about the zero to 30 um, for each individual home. Incorporate as much as you can in the zero to five. I, I answered that in one of the questions earlier. Um, uh, Ty typed an answer. Um, for a property that has existing trees and shrubs in the zero to five, for sure I would remove them from um, areas that I specified you shouldn't plant, like underneath a window or under an eave um, or a vent or, and of course, the requirement for, or in an inside corner. And then, of course, the requirement from the county is if you have tree limbs within 10 feet of a stovepipe or chimney that that, that be cut back. I, you know, we get that this is more complicated in existing mature landscapes, but for sure I would remove woody shrub masses from those areas or in that zero to five zone. Um, we do, you know, if someone has to have something in that zone, we do recommend that you, you probably want to consider um, lower growing perennials, grasses, succulents. Um, start thinking about how much woody mass is, is in your landscape and maybe incur, incorporate in things that don't um, become woody over time. Um, this is a perfect opportunity to get that neighborhood idea. So you, exactly. know, you can really link up with a bunch of your neighbors and get natives in there and get a few more shrubs. So then you get, you don't have a Ex Exactly. Area. So for a more dense neighborhood, um, it, it, all these principles are still really important, but, but you do have a bigger picture to look at it. How do you create this with your neighbors as a whole, as a community? Some of those, areas like Oakmont have HOA requirements and that's yeah. an area where you can um, be involved in the discussions and sort of influence what the HOA recommendations are. And yeah. if you want us to give a presentation to any of your HOAs or other groups we can certainly do that. We have quite yeah. a few sites going in in Oakmont and um, it's really it's really like neat to see a community changing over to natives and, and working with, with us about that. Okay. Uh, one question is, my oak tends to have lots of moss, which spreads to other shrubs. Is this a concern? Hmm. Maybe it's, a, it's an overwatering situation? It might be. 
is are you uh, well it's kind of hard to get into a direct interview yeah, it, it could be about, yeah. so we don't the uh it's it's very natural for oaks to have moss i mean that's a that's a very normal circumstance i'm i'm not familiar with how it's spreading to shrubs so that that does seem curious yeah but i you know, I, I noticed in the in the 2017 fires that the moss on the trees did actually ignite but mm -hmm. that was usually because the grasses around the trees and this is in the Sonoma Valley Regional Park were very tall and so the fire actually went from the grasses onto the moss so I just recommend keeping the shrubs away from the trees but I, I wouldn't recommend trying to remove the moss from the oak trees yeah yeah, I mean, if there's a lot of it accumulating somewhere, I would clear it if it's on the ground, right? Or yeah, definitely. Well, for sure, if it's in the zero to five foot zone, I would clear it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, another I question it is on a mulch, a type of mulch, and somebody's asking about uh, using grapeseed compost as a mulch in the um, in the. Uh, I'm sorry. Is if it, they could use that because they don't want to use gravel in the five, one, zero to five zone. Now we do some, we do recommend that you could use compost in that area. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, uh, so the study that I referenced from the University of Nevada at Reno and the University of California did not, grapeseed compost was not one of the components that was tested. So uh, unfortunately I don't have any, um, any research that supports whether that is more or less flammable than bark bark mulch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Can you just yeah. cut back salvia into the woody part and expect herbaceous growth again? That's what you said, right? Yes. So I actually, um, I, I actually lost well, one of three salvias that I cut back because I cut it back too hard. Um, but to regenerate it beautifully. So, you know, it is a balance when you're cutting back woody shrubs to not cut them back too hard because you might not revegetate, you might not uh, generate uh, uh, herbaceous growth. So um, uh, getting into specifics on, you know, all the different possible plant species for maintenance um, is a little difficult for this presentation, but I will, I do, I would love to mention that um, uh, Cleo is part of a team of master gardeners that are developing a new um, maintenance, firewise maintenance workshop um, that we'll uh, start giving in August. So uh, I recommend checking out our website to keep an eye out for that. Uh, there's one last one. Uh, who's responsible for trimming branches that are oops, growing into the street? What does the county require for older trees planted within 10 feet of the road? Roberta? Are you here? Well, I, don't, I mean, it sounds like that doesn't sound like a fire issue. Really. It sounds oh, like. Yeah. So the question it sounds to me like is with regard to roadside fields reduction. Is that how I understand the question? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's on your frontage, um, I would suggest just clear it. I mean, you, you can't do the whole road, of course. And then, you know, if, if it's a county road, honestly, the county transportation and public works is their obligation is to trim along the roadways, not for fuels reduction, for fire, or even for access, but it's for visibility. However, if it is limiting access and it is a county maintained road, I would suggest you contact County TPW and you know file a complaint and ask them to do something about it. Can, can you tell them, can you put in the chat how to do that, how to file a complaint? Yeah, I, I, I'll just talk about it because it's going to be too labor intensive to go and look it up and, and provide that info textually. So if you go to the county's website, they have a, a reporting section where you can report issues to the county. And I believe they might even have a departmental drop down where you go to, okay, TPW, if you have an issue, type it in there. And that's probably going to be the, the best way to, to get your message across to them. And I just, I just want to clarify that using the term clear is it, it's a fire agency term, but it means prune, trim, and mow. It doesn't mean cut down. And, and uh, I think when I hear the word clear, I think, you know, in that 10 foot zone, you have to cut everything down, but that's not true. If there's a tree growing in that 10 foot zone, your responsibility is to prune up the tree and keep it clear of dead and dying wood and mow the grasses. 
Okay, uh, there's one last one. Uh, who's responsible for trimming branches that are oops, growing into the street? What does the county require for older trees planted within 10 feet of the road? Roberta? Yeah, so the question it sounds to me like is with regard to roadside fields reduction, is that how I understand the question? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so if it's on your frontage, um, I would suggest just clear it. I mean, you, you can't do the whole road, of course. And then, you know, if, if it's a county road, honestly, the county transportation and public works is their obligation is to trim along the roadways, not for fuels reduction, for fire, or even for access, but it's for visibility. However, if it is limiting access and it is a county maintained road, I would suggest you contact County TPW and you know file a complaint and ask them to do something about it. Can, can you tell them, can you put in the chat how to do that, how to file a complaint? Yeah, I, I, I'll just talk about it because it's gonna be too labor intensive to go and look it up and, and provide that info textually. So if you go to the county's website, they have a, a reporting section where you can report issues to the county. And I believe they might even have a departmental drop down where you go to, okay, TPW, if you have an issue, type it in there. And that's probably going to be the, the best way to, to get your message across to them. And I just, I just want to clarify that using the term clear is it, it's a fire agency term, but it means prune, trim, and mow. It doesn't mean cut down. And, and uh, I think when I hear the word clear, I think, you know, in that 10 foot zone, you have to cut everything down, but that's not true. If there's a tree growing in that 10 foot zone, your responsibility is to prune up the tree and keep it clear of dead and dying wood and mow the grasses. I want to thank you very much, uh, Ellie, Mimi, April, and Cleo for your informative and beautifully illustrated workshop. Um, I'm sure the attendees learned a lot and uh, a lot of practical facts and ideas. Uh, and many thanks, Roberta, and to you and, and to FireSafe Sonoma for providing the Zoom platform for today's workshop and Roberta for your invaluable help and support as we've developed the Grove Street Fire Safe Council. Uh, as, I, as we've discussed, the workshop will be available on the Sonoma Ecology Center's website uh, for your That's viewing helpful. pleasure and perpetual reference. Uh, and before we go, I wanna support Ellie's point that many of the steps you can take should be done uh, during the periods that bird and wildlife are not nesting and are less active uh, and this coincides with a general concept uh, that fuel reduction and home hardening is best performed during periods other than right before or during fire season. Uh, as we used to say when I was a volunteer football coach, uh, winning teams are built during the off season. So if you let that kind of be your guide, this is a, a, a something you should be thinking about and doing during other times other than when everything suddenly warms up and gets dry. Uh, a lot of the work can and should be done at other times of the year. And I also want to point out that we have two of the Jack Cohen videos on our website, the Grove Street Fire Safe Council website. Uh, he's the fire researcher that um, Mimi mentioned. And they're very informative and have some excellent videos that dramatically illustrate the principles that were discussed today and especially there's an awesome video of the ember simulator. It's pretty amazing what they do to study this stuff. Uh, and most especially, I wanna thank all of you, the attendees for attending today's workshop. We appreciate your time on a Saturday morning, on a beautiful Saturday morning, and it shows your commitment to mitigating fire risks in our community. And that said, I suggest you all get out on this beautiful day and start trimming and pruning and all that good stuff. So thank you again, and uh, we'll see you soon.